Jamie Lemke is uh, a PhD, uh, has a PhD in economics from George Mason University, is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and a senior fellow in the F.A. Hyatt program for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics. She's going to be telling us today about a thinker that I think is really important and that more people should know about, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, all the interesting things that she has in her work. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Jamie. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for encouraging us to start off by imagining this possible alternative reality of being in the commons on a sunny summer day, because I think that kind of imagination uh, will suit well uh, the discussion that we're going to have about Eleanor Ostrom today. Um, and page proofs for that book are expected next week, so hopefully it won't be too long of a wait for whoever the the, the lucky winner is hopefully they consider themselves lucky after they get it. Um, so I want to start off today just by sharing with you all uh, a little bit of Eleanor Ostrom's life story. I want to touch on three of her major research areas and then wrap up with some of the lessons that I've taken from this um, for my own study and that I that I believe she has imparted upon the social sciences in general. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom had a life that I find to be personally inspiring. She was told no many times, encountered many different kinds of obstacles, both uh, personal and professional, to being able to uh, have success in her career and managed to go on to win the highest award available in political science, the highest award available in economics, and in general, change the face of how we think about human organization. Um, so she uh, originally was working in a almost a secretarial capacity. That's where she started out her work, was denied admission to the PhD program in economics at UCLA. Uh, fortunately was admitted to the political science department at UCLA. And at least according to um, a couple sources, part of the reason why the economics department was so reluctant to admit her was that they had admitted three women as what they considered to be an experiment the year prior. And in their view, the experiment had not gone well. Um, so that wound up leaving Eleanor Ostrom um, kind of being forced to change her plans. This was a, a moment in time where for a woman, especially a married woman, to go into a professional career, there were both cultural barriers and organizational barriers. So this wound up contributing to the dissolution of her first marriage, um, in addition to, to shaping her studies. Um, it's hard to say, looking back, that any influence on her studies would be to the bad, because of course she wound up becoming incredibly successful and contributing greatly. Um, so I think without, well, there's one other important uh, biographical tidbit that I do wanna share before I go into her major research projects. And that's that out of this background of you know, overcoming adversity to even get the PhD, meeting her future collaborator, Vincent Ostrom and co-founder of the workshop during those studies, when she eventually wound up at the University of Illinois Bloomington, she wound up taking on this major leadership role and founding, co-founding along with Vincent Ostrom, the workshop in political theory and policy analysis. So that's another important biographical tidbit that you need to know. So political scientist overcame barriers, had a very close collaborative relationship with not just her husband, Vincent Ostrom, but with a whole cadre of researchers who she worked with at that workshop and also became an organizational leader. So she's hitting on all cylinders organizationally and intellectually. And that's what's gonna really drive the three research projects that I'm about to share with you. Okay, so I wanna start at the beginning uh, with her dissertation research, which was on water resource management. So this is a project that Vincent Ostrom had been very interested in originally as well, even from um, his time as a young man. And the big question that they wanted to understand was, how does water get to the tap? And if water's not getting to the tap, 
how is it that people figure out uh, what the obstacle is and how they can overcome that. So from the very beginning of their research, you see this interest in very tangible questions, the questions of, of daily life, and also an interest in understanding how people overcome and how people overcome the different problems that we encounter as we go about interacting with each other and bumping into each other in social environments. So out of this research, out of this research that she did in communities that were facing problems with their water management and were facing water shortages, she developed an interest in public entrepreneurship, how it is that people get creative about devising new solutions to public problems, much in the same way that entrepreneurs in the market get creative about helping people resolve the different wants and needs that they face in their own lives. She also became interested in public-private partnerships, which I think is interesting because this comes to be one of the great challenges that she issues both to adherents of government as savior models of thinking about public goods and also adherents of what you might call uh, an atomistic version of market theory that thinks we should just think about aloneness and separateness as something that is going to, to be able to drive the best possible problem solving and the best possible solutions. So this is really where she starts thinking about this great space that can exist between government solutions to our problems and atomistic market solutions to our problems and starts to imagine this great variety of ways that different people and different organizations might be able to cooperate. And this leads into uh, what Paul Alajika and Vlad Tarko and others have, have noted as being the, the workshop's focus on institutional diversity. So this idea that there are so many different ways to solve a problem and that solutions are going to be specific both to the details of that problem, but also the, the particulars of the community that's facing that problem, um, that there's no easy one size fits all. I was re-watching uh, last night the wonderful documentary that Barbara Allen put together for PBS called Actual World Possible Futures. And in there, she talks about her, the work that she did on governing the commons. And, I, and I'll talk about that as, as one of her research programs in just a moment. But this work that she did on governing the commons, her kind of magnum opus that is the final accumulation of all of these decades of work. At first, she was worried it was failing because she wasn't able to identify, OK, these are the rules. This is the rule you put in place in order to solve your collective problem. She realized she needed to, to back out. There was never going to be a specific one size fits all solution. Instead, we get at most modes of interacting with each other, ways of coming about solutions that are more effective than others, but you can never accent ex ante identify the one way forward that's going to work for every group and for every problem. Um, so, you know, out of this dissertation research on, on water resource management, we get this ultimate finding that we don't have to choose between the market or the state. And instead, when she went in and talked to the different citizens that were involved, uh, that were working with the various local public authorities, um, they were not dependent on their government, nor were they working on their own. They were cooperating together in order to resolve that problem. So I think that kind of partnership, that togetherness, um, is one big lesson that comes out of that first research project. Um, the second major research project area that I want to share with you, um, because I think understanding her work on this research really informs also a lot of what comes later, 
is the study she did on the provision of policing services. And um, this was motivated by a movement in the public administration literature at the time, 1950s, 1960s, to think that in order to provide better public services, the way our governments could serve us better was to be more professionalized and more consolidated. So the idea is that, again, that there is one best way that we can go about providing local services. And, and by this, I mean police, but also water, sanitation, um, education, anything that you can imagine uh, that meets that criteria of being a local public good. So it's a, a public good in the sense that it benefits everybody who's involved and who's participating in this group. It's not easily excludable, um, but it's small. So it's not the major public goods like national defense. It's goods that the relevant community for these goods is gonna be smaller, the city, the town. Um, so in these debates about metropolitan consolidation, the public administration literature was advocating, okay, we have all of these different police departments spread out across cities like Indianapolis, like Chicago, like Nashville. And it doesn't make any sense because they're all engaging in functionally the same kinds of activities. So we're wasting effort. What we should do instead is bring all of these different police departments together under one banner, under one leadership, and then we can eliminate that waste. Eleanor Ostrom's concern about that and her challenge to that was, well, but what if there isn't really just one way forward? What if these communities are actually different enough that they require different services. Uh, and one of the examples that she offers is the juvenile delinquent out engaged in, you know, vandalism or some kind of petty crime. Does the police officer, when they stop that kid, take them to their parents and say, this kid needs a good talking to? Or do they take them to the police department and enter them into the, the formal justice system? Which I think we now in 2020 have a much better understanding of the way that that can be uh, a limiting factor on, on that person than for the rest of their life. So in order to study whether or not one size fits all policing was going to be best and therefore we should consolidate, Eleanor Ostrom and the other researchers at the workshop focused on citizen satisfaction as their measure of whether or not police departments were performing well. And so often you might think of safety statistics, crime statistics as the obvious way that you would want to evaluate the efficacy of a police department. Her challenge to that was maybe, and we don't want to ignore those crime statistics, but you know, Statistics might be about murder and robbery, but they can also be about arrest rates. So they can drive kind of perverse behaviors. They can encourage the police to be antagonistic towards that community rather than working with that community. But more fundamentally, different communities will make different trade-offs with respect to how much they think is worth investing in public safety as a goal, as compared to the many other things that that community might want to accomplish and what their concerns might be. So her idea in looking at citizen satisfaction was, okay, so if we look at whether or not citizens are satisfied with the police department, then we'll know whether those people think they are getting the right degree of safety and policing, as opposed to getting the maximum degree of safety and policing, which is what you would get out of looking at the statistics. So what they found in looking at citizen satisfaction, and they were comparing police departments that were allowed to remain independent with ones that had been consolidated and forced into this one size fits all system. And they found that citizen satisfaction actually remained higher 
in the unconsolidated police departments. And this might come across as a, an evaluation of a relatively minor policy issue, but for Eleanor Ostrom and her team, it had major implications because it challenged this idea that the experts can come in and tell communities how they should be interacting with each other and how they should be resolving their own problems. So like the research on water resource management systems was um, kind of a, a poke in the eye of authority and an argument in favor of turning problem solving over to communities and over to bottom up processes, the policing studies wound up um, coming to a, a similar big picture conclusion, but in this entirely different um, area. All right, the third research project that I want to, to introduce and to share with you is the one that you might be most familiar. And it's the one that Matt referred to when he was opening up his comments. And this is the study of common pool resources and their management. So common pool resources are you know, like the field where the sheep are idyllically grazing in Matt's childhood. Um, they are resources that many people want to use and access, but no one person has rights over such that they can control that access and prevent over predation and drawing down of that resource to the point where it becomes long-term unsustainable. So many of the applications of this are environmental. It has to deal with the health of, of water, bodies of water, fishing populations, forests, um, the environment. Later in her life, she even extended her study to climate change and explored how uh, that what she found about commons applied to, to global commons like the climate. Um, so her way of approaching this question about commons and the management of commons was to study both in real life by traveling around the world and historically by doing case studies in deep history. Um, she studied different farming communities, different groups of fishers, different communities that were trying to manage uh, forest resources. and tried to identify how it was that they prevented those resources from becoming destroyed. And Eleanor Ostrom frequently cited um, the idea of the tragedy of the commons as what she was arguing against. So the tragedy of the commons was this idea proposed that if a commons was not given over to a single authority to manage, then it would inevitably wind up destroyed and useless. And looking around the world and looking in the history books, that seemed to not actually be the case in the real world. Um, so why was the real world behaving so differently than this theoretical prediction? And what she did in these case studies and, and in her work, um, by the way, not just as a researcher, but also as an advisor trying to propose different solutions to these communities and help them come up with what might work for them. Uh, she began to identify what was important about these processes. And I, and I don't have time to go through all the details. I'll point you towards uh, the design principles that she elaborates in the book, Governing the Commons and, and much of her other research, but a couple key, um, key features of this kind of institutional design that I think are most important is that A, the solutions being proposed are coming um, from within the community, or at least they are being adopted at the behest of the community. So top-down is not in the vocabulary. And the reason for that has to do with, again, getting at the actual trade-offs that people were facing in their daily lives and how well any particular rule change would help them solve their problems as they perceived them. And second, and this is very closely related, is she really highlighted the importance of getting 
a large part of the community directly involved. So she thought civic participation and getting actively involved yourself as an individual in the different rule setting processes and problem solving processes that were going on around you was critically important. You know, we see this in the police studies. One of the difficulties that emerged as different cities were trying to learn from her research and trying to implement more community oriented policing is that you know, if you have cops just show up in a community where police citizen relationships are not currently good and there's not yet trust, then citizens are afraid to get involved and you don't actually get civic participation in problem solving. Similarly, if you're going into say a, a, a community where that town or that village survives off of the proceeds of fishing, if you can't actually get the fishers themselves to find it worthwhile to participate in your rule setting process, what are the odds that they're actually going to then follow those rules when they're out on the boat in the middle of the ocean? Not likely. So you need to get buy-in, you need to get active participation in order to get rules that will be followed and rules that will ultimately be effective. Um, so the big lesson that I would point to out of, out of that body of work is the idea that self-governance is real and it exists in many different forms, but it's near universal. So people can and do actively solve problems for themselves. Okay, so now I want to, uh, you know, in the last 10 minutes or so here, draw some some lessons. So, so what do we get out of all of this? She's studying these very small specific problems. Are there big lessons that we can draw? And I would suggest that they are because it's the small specific problems. It's the small cooperative processes that we engage in every day in our daily life that wind up forming the larger social processes and systems that we think of as being human society. But it's not really that meta level that is the, the stuff of life. It's the, it's the daily, it's these on the ground problem solving processes that are the, the stuff that we should be concerned with as people who want to understand the world. All right, so one lesson um, or one implication the great diversity of rules and governance solutions that exist in the world um, outside of formally articulated law. So law is included in this, but it's not the whole picture because we've been talking about, um, you know, what happens within communities and what, you know, the, the roles that, that co-ops and um, citizen advocacy organizations and individual businesses, you know, all these organizations are part of this system and they wind up shaping and participating in the shaping of law, of rules rather. Um, so the fact that there's so much rule and governance that happens outside the formal law implies that the rules of life are not always what they seem when you just read the law books, the actual rules that people face, the actual constraints that people face when they try to navigate their daily life can be quite different from the formal rules. So this is why communication and civic involvement are important in a democratic society. So without that individual voice, that common language between people where humans as a group can come to understand each other well enough that we can figure out a set of rules that we can all agree to. Um, you know, that, that individual involvement, that communication is what you need in order to figure out what the real obstacles and what the real constraints are. And a corollary of this and, and a second implication of her research is that this is also why field work is important in the social sciences. So just like we need to interact with each other in real life in order to solve problems, whether that's in your um, apartment building, 
or in your neighborhood or in your university or your place of work or your, your town, city. Um, in the social sciences, in order to understand those processes as an external observer, you have to do field work. You have to get on the ground. Otherwise, you can dramatically misconstrue the actual problems and trade-offs that are involved, and you can wind up giving um, a terrible take as an external observer. So this explains a lot why the armchair expert can often be wrong, especially the more personal the problem they're commenting on and the more distant it is from their own personal experience. So this is why she was such a strong advocate and why she was willing to make the investment, even with all the, the resources and that she had at her disposal at Indiana University. You know, she could have had um, just a phenomenal career without bothering to do all that travel and without bothering to do all that extra work. She could have stopped much earlier than she actually did. Um, but she was driven by this kind of this need to impress upon others and this need herself to get out and understand what was really happening, what was really going on. So I think this importance of field work is something that has yet to be fully embraced throughout the social sciences. There are some disciplines that are much better at it than others. Um, but I think it's a very understandable implication of some of her findings that, uh, you know, top-down interventions based on theoretical expertise can go wrong because they're missing that community element. The third implication I want to share is that if you look at her, her water and police and common studies, they all involve this bottom-up problem solving, and therefore they all involve distribution of power. So you don't have power centered in one organization, in one group in your society. Instead, you actually have it distributed across many different organizations, often organizations that are in competition with each other to um, not only get their solution implemented, but for the, they're competing for the, um, the buy-in of the community for, for the, their own kind of consumer. And so this distribution of power throughout the society not only helps you get better rules, but it also prevents abuse of power. And if you look at, uh, especially the political theory that was contributed by Vincent Ostrom, but any of the more foundational work as opposed to the, the specific empirical applied studies, this idea that we need to figure out how to, to get along with disaggregated power is also important to Eleanor Ostrom and to Vincent Ostrom because of the way it helps you avoid tyranny. So they also had a deep concern with the pressing problem of the 20th century, which was the way that expertise and the desire for social control was leading to mass tragedy around the world. So the, the grand communist experiments are probably the single biggest example, but this bottom-up problem solving, it's about getting the right rules. It's also about preventing abuse of power and oppression. Uh, the, the fourth out of five implications that I wanna leave you all with here is that I think Eleanor Ostrom's work illustrates the importance of stepping up yourself to create the rules of your own game. So we saw her do this, um, you know, analytically in her academic work, but also in her work as a policy advisor and as the, the founder and leader of the workshop in political theory and policy analysis. The people who worked with her were so deeply invested in these research projects about the commons and about local problem solving that it's like she was more than one person. She really had whole teams of people who were brought onto her vision. That's it's true leadership. And it also illustrates to us 
the kind of leadership that can be undertaken also in our own communities and in our own lives. Um, and this kind of message of possibility is uh, kind of leads me into the final implication I want to share with you, which is what I view as being ultimately a message of optimism that comes out of Eleanor Ostrom's research program. And that message is that we are not trapped. We can be free. We can create the rules of our own game. We can find ways to work together to mutual benefit. Um, so this is something that we, you know, observe all the time, this kind of freedom existing in uh, market societies. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a better understanding. Certainly, it's still a lot of misunderstanding about how freedom actually operates in a market. But I think there's a better understanding of the way that leaving people free to make their own production and exchange and consumption decisions winds up leading to good for all. It's the way that we serve each other through the market. And Eleanor Ostrom offers us this way that we can extend and apply that also outside of what we traditionally think of as being the economic exchange arena. We can also engage in this kind of cooperative exchange on a collective level. Um, we can recognize where we are and creatively come up with these changes and rules that can make our communities better. Um, so I, I don't want to be overly utopian about it. This doesn't, and maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A, but this doesn't necessarily mean that bottom-up problem solving is always going to be pretty because people have different visions about the future and we need to, to fight and eventually reconcile about those. Um, you know, there are problems associated with power. If you're currently a person who's very happy with the status quo, it might take a lot to get you to renegotiate your position. So it, this is not um, a utopian vision by any means, but I do think it's an optimistic one in that no matter where you are, no matter what the status quo looks like, you do have the capacity to imagine a different future and work to bring it about. And, and that's, the, that's the big message that I think Eleanor Ostrom has brought to the social sciences and to the world. Um, and I think, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Um, I'm really excited to, to talk with you all about whatever aspects of Eleanor Ostrom's life or research agenda you're interested in learning more about. And thank you for joining me. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jamie. This is the point where I feel like we should be together in a room and there should be some applause. We can't do that. I know some people like to sort of virtually give a hand and I think that's always great. I've got a few questions coming in. I'm going to start with those and encourage anyone else who has a question they haven't asked to either post it into the chat or just send it to me privately if you prefer to do that. Um, Mike Cust asked in the chat earlier for some uh, links and citations of Ostrom's climate change policy and a couple of people have put those in. Uh, one paper uh, is uh, her polycentric approach for coping with climate change, and then another paper co-authored with Michael McGinnis. But I want to build on that because I think this is a really interesting, uh, you know, topic. Uh, you know, I think we both would probably describe ourselves as classical liberals, and many people in the political dynamics think that that means that maybe that comes associated with some sort of skepticism of climate change or of opposition to certain solutions. Um, but I think it's actually a really interesting field with lots of lots of rich ideas. So maybe you can take that uh, that request for citations as a chance to talk a little bit about how uh, Ostrom's ideas can be applied to climate change. Um, and if you have any additional papers or, or you know, writings that uh, that you think should be read by someone interested in Ostrom and climate change, please do suggest those too. I, I think the paper you mentioned is probably the best place to start. But I didn't get much chance. It, it's such a short talk. I didn't get chance really to elaborate on the concept of polycentricity which was really important to Eleanor's research. And polycentricity is the idea that we can still all be operating within a coherent rule system together, but without centralizing. So we can still have many different centers of power 
It's okay if they overlap. It's okay if they're working on the same kind of projects. It's okay if they're duplicating effort. Um, but you can, it's all of these levels wind up shaping what the actual rules that people you know, what the actual rules are that people face when they go about life. So we're talking about different levels of government being part of this, but also voluntary organization, uh, business organization through the market, any kind of international or even just cross-jurisdictional treaties or agreements. These all are this, you know, this complex soup that we're trying to navigate. And with respect to climate change, Eleanor Ostrom's big observation is that all of these different levels of organization are going to be involved in coming up with a, any kind of solution that might actually have a beneficial impact in terms of you know, any global environmental issue, including climate. So even if they're, you know, it, it's often pointed out that since we can't control where the atmosphere goes, many people allege that that implies any solution to a, a climate change uh, problem would need to necessarily be global and require then some global level apparatus of coercion that could require people around the world to comply. And, you know, she says that's not really true because many of the actions that we take that wind up having an impact on the climate are small things. They're things that we do in our, in our everyday life. They have to do with you know, how well is your um, community set up to rely on you know, foot transportation instead of cars? What kind of power systems are you hooked into? I don't wanna go too far down getting you know, specific because I'm not a, an environment expert, but her point was that even if a global treaty or something like that never comes, if you care about the climate, you can still make a substantive difference by changing the rules that are in effect at the local level and in your own community, both because that will change what your community is doing and because it will have an impact on the broader system of rules that your community is a part of. So again, it's kind of, it's an inspiring vision because it points towards the way that you and as an individual, as a family, as a, a group of colleagues and friends, you know, the way that you, those people can make a difference without needing to wait to be rescued by some external savior. Wonderful, great, thank you. And that actually leads well into our second question, which also addresses polycentricity and Ostrom's thought. Um, so the question asks you to characterize the relationship between Ostrom's thoughts on polycentricity and Wagner's ent uh, entangled political economy. And I'll have to ask you to t talk briefly about what Wagner's entangled political economy is for those who may not be familiar. Uh, but the question is, how are those concepts similar and how are they distinct? I think they're quite related. You know, Richard Wagner is a public choice economist. He's coming out of that tradition, worked very closely with Jim Buchanan when, uh, when they were both at George Mason University. And Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom were both also uh, deeply involved with public choice from the, the early days. They were both early, if I'm remembering correctly, they were both early presidents of the organization. Um, and so, like the Ostrom's approach to understanding the world as, a, as this complicated polycentric nexus, Wagner's entangled political economy is also pushing us to understand the ways in which all of the different social systems that we're a part of are interconnected. There's no such thing as being purely economic. It's always entangled with the political and the social. So I think they are very compatible approaches in that they encourage this systemic rules-driven thinking rather than falling back on easy dichotomies and definitions in order to kind of try to isolate individual decisions as being just one thing or the other, just economic or just political or 
you know, you're talking about culture, so that's not relevant to the economy or that's not relevant to our politics. You know, that's, I think they both reject that kind of idea. It's, it's just people, it's just rules. Great, thanks. Um, so our next question asks, uh, if you think there's a limit to the size of the community that this can apply to, of course, a lot of Ostrom's ideas are, are about using sort of, you know, community relationships rather than what we think of as sort of very top-down government as a way to achieve these things. Um, but that's going to look very different in maybe a small village to, to a larger city. Um, any thoughts on, on how that scales? In many ways, they are, um, you know, this, the question of scale is at the heart of this. And the answer, the direct answer to the question is, it depends if that counts as a direct answer. And, and what I mean by that is, what problem is the community trying to solve? If it's something that is highly specific and requires a great deal of oversight on behalf of the people who are involved. So if you are, for example, some of the irrigation systems that she studies in governing the commons, they're set up in such a way that the farmer next to you is outside to observe when and how much you're watering your plants at your designated, or your crops at your designated watering time. So if it's something that requires a, a high degree of oversight, and that's going to be contingent both on, you know, it's going to be contingent on the problem you're facing, the rule you come up with to address it, and also the, the nature of your community and your culture, then that's gonna have to be smaller. If the rule that you have all agreed on in order to resolve a problem is simpler, if it requires less oversight, then it can safely cover a much greater space. Um, so I think that idea of scaling your solution to fit with the problem you're facing is part of the Ostrom's program. And I would also be remiss if I didn't bring up the idea that if you have some kind of local organization or, or local association, that doesn't mean that your range of influence is limited only to that locality because that locality or that organization can then cooperate with other localities and other organizations. So one of the solution types that comes up in some of their research is that maybe your local bottom-up solution is not to provide yourself. Maybe it's to contract with somebody else. I live in the independent city of Falls Church, which I think is, uh, it's one of the smallest population areas in, in Washington, D.C., Virginia is managing the COVID vaccination process through local public health departments, but we're so small, we don't have one. So does that mean I don't get a vaccine? No, it means Falls Church has contracted that to Fairfax and I'm in line with the Fairfaxian. Um, so the, this idea of different local groups cooperating with each other is also part of it. So um, that expands, I think, the, the range of possibilities that we can imagine and the range of problems that we can imagine addressing through bottom-up solutions. Right. Uh, the next question feeds right into that. Uh, it's about the idea of bottom-up solutions uh, being appropriate in some cases, uh, maybe top-down uh, solutions are appropriate in other cases, and it was often coming from government. To what degree do you think that these sort of bottom-up solutions uh, could be complements to those more top-down solutions, or are they actually fully substitutes and things where the, the top-down rules should be replaced by more bottom-up rules? That's such a, it's a, it's a pretty meta question. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that with it, with, with a universal solution. So maybe I, I won't try and I'll, I'll go back to, again to, to it depends. So I think given that the Ostroms were so embedded in trying to understand social reality as it existed, I think that prevents us from imagining that we can just replace wholesale existing systems. So we, 
currently live in a world of nation states where most people on the planet are governed by some kind of national government. You can't wipe that history clean. You can't wipe that memory clean, even if you wanted to. So we kind of have to start the negotiation process from where we are. So bottom up and top down solutions certainly are substitutes for each other in the sense that they are, you know, they are themselves alternative ways to solving any particular problem, but also different mixtures of, and, and by the way, I'm kind of, I'm, I've kind of shifted a little bit and I'm, I've, I'm equating top down with kind of a high level government. So different combinations of that lower and higher level government can be seen as alternatives. But also, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer as to whether our existing federal structures, at least in a democratic society, how much of that is top down and how much of it is, is bottom up. So I think to a certain extent, it depends on how romantic you are about the, the constitutional process and the, the founding of democratic governments. So to the extent that even that very high level government is operating at the will of the people, and if it truly reflects the will of the people, then maybe it's bottom up. Of course, the, the more that a federal government takes on, the more it becomes difficult to even imagine the people even having any idea what that federal government is doing much less, you know, the will of individual peoples actually being substantively driving what happens at the federal level in any meaningful way. And I think that's the world that we're in today where there's a pretty loose relationship between the will of the people and what the United States Senate does. Um, but you certainly can imagine shifting in that direction. And there certainly are many societies that have successfully shifted in the direction of more local control. All right, thanks. I've got one more question that I think sort of feeds into this theme. Then we're gonna to go to Mike Cust, who's asked if he can ask you a question with his, uh, with his voice and in the old fashioned way, like we might in an actual room. But uh, just to do one more uh, question, that I, th I think so connects a bit to what you've been saying. Uh, a questioner who asks if Ostrom had any specific views uh, about the sort of optimal size of, of a minimal state. Was she like looking at Nozick or anything like that for any of those ideas? So this is my, my read of her, is that she wanted to challenge you. So if she was in a room of libertarians, she would challenge you on your libertarian ideas. But if she was in a room full of socialists, she would challenge you on your socialist ideas. So I, I think it's kind of inconsistent with her entire approach for her to come up with some ideal vision of society because her ideal was the democratic ideal. It was that the people should determine that for themselves. And you know the danger of democracy is that maybe the people don't determine what you want them to. But again, her, you know, her focus there was on processes that were genuinely democratic and that they were voluntary on the part of the people who were participating in them. You could, you know, you were free to fight against them and to refuse to engage if you wanted to. So we can have many debates on how well any democratic process in reality works compared to that ideal. Um, but although she, she learned from a really wide range of political theorists, and we know that Ostrom's read and were influenced by Mises and Hayek, especially, um, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, they were committed to democracy, but not necessarily to any highly specific vision of what that democracy had to achieve. Great, wonderful. I'm going to turn things over to Mike Cust for a minute to ask you a question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is a question about um, basically the tension between polycentrism, privatization, and uh, state control or state-directed control, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, so you say that she sets up her work um, of polycentrism in contrast to privatization and nationalization. And, um, but uh, when, when there's climate change, um, it seems difficult to have pure polycentrism because it's a global issue. Um, polycentrism certainly can be, the case can be made at the national level, like let every country pursue their own thing. Now, if we're going to have international polycentrism, would it be contradictory or problematic for Ostrom to have some type of privatization or collectivization or at the national level combined with like an international regime of polycentrism or because she is sort of very stringently against, or not very stringently against, but skeptical of privatization and nationalization, would it would there also have to be polycentrism at the national level? Well, I think we do have polycentrism at the national level in the sense that nation national governments are considered sovereign. So they do have some range of authority. And you know, a government can be sovereign with respect to a particular set of choices and responsibilities um, without them necessarily needing to be completely separate from the rest of the global order. But I think, but the bigger, um, the bigger idea I want to, to offer in response to your very good question um, is that internet, some kind of international agreement or international treaty that would be a part of a polycentric order. It, it wouldn't be an alternative to a polycentric order. So it allows po for coordination, but just not for an imposed solution. Is that fair? Because to me, like, because you can, you can have several things with an international order, right? It can just be something where you have like the Paris Accord where they just all agree to certain standards, right? And then it's a coordinating mechanism. But then you could also have like actual climate change international law where, you know, uh, a country adversely affected by climate change could sue a large emitter like China or the United States or whatever and, and seek damages from them. So um, I guess, yeah, so there's one question there, which is like, how, what, what role would polycentrism play with at the international level? But then would she be opposed to you know, if Holland, I don't know, privatizes emission rights and sells them, but uh, Denmark decides that they're just going to centrally control everything. Like, is she going to be opposed to that because she would oppose those solutions for like a local lake? Or, you know, or like, I, I guess what I mean is, um, and the second question is what interests me more. It's like, um, like what's acceptable under her theory for countries to pursue? Like since she, she since she's against or since she's reticent of privatization and nationalization, are they also something she's hesitant to at the national level? Yeah, I so I think I understand your question. And without wanting to put words in her mouth. Yes. I'll just answer for myself if that's okay. Um, so poly if you're applying her principles, then I, it's a good yeah. That's I'm attempting to apply her okay, principles. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think you know the democratic ideal kind of prevents the external expert from deciding that they know for themselves what the ideal solution is, but I think you know the major thrust of her research agenda is that the more centralized the locus of power is, the more likely it is to become subject to both abuse of power and to coming up with rules that are not going to work with what people need to do to actually navigate their daily lives and bring about effective solutions. So it's whether the you know the alternative solutions you describe are 
acceptable or, you know, I, I don't know if acceptable or unacceptable is the right phrasing. Maybe instead, what would those, what are those two alternative systems likely to accomplish given the reality on the ground in those two different countries? So I think the approach is to raise questions about that. And anytime you're centralizing, to ask, are you doing so in a way that's taking away authority from the people who are on the ground who you actually need to be changing their behavior in order to get the solution you want? Um, so hmm. I think okay, no, there, there can- It's helpful, yeah. There can be many different approaches that kind of coexist simultaneously, but ideally you would want those to kind of emerge beginning as cooperative agreements kind of from the, the lowest level possible. Um, but yeah, it's, I think polycentricity is a difficult concept to visualize, particularly when you're talking about a global problem set. And so that's yeah. part of what I find so valuable about Ostrom's research is that it forces you to expand your well, yeah. imagination about yeah. what, you know, what, what problems and solutions can look like. Just one more point on that. It's just the, um, the, the, the skeptical, or the, the, what makes me skeptical is like, um, having pure polycentrism for climate change to me, like I'm just skeptical of it as a coordination problem, you know. Well, like, yeah. if, if, like polycentrism is not a, a it's not a proposal. So you wouldn't say like let's our, our solution is polycentrism. Right. Polycentrism is a description of a political order. So it's simply a reality that we live in a polycentric world because I, we do we do have sovereign nations that have authority. We have different you know, governments and organizations within those that have authority. And so it's not a question of getting rid of polycentrism. It's just, do we, uh, you know, do we combine or disaggregate authorities further within that existing structure? Right. So it's, it's like how when an economist says, um, look, uh, I don't think it's I'm not here to make a moral judgment on selfishness. I'm just here to tell you that's generally how people behave. So we have to take that as an assumption for how we're going to analyze things. It doesn't mean that I'm saying people should be selfish or it's like uh, some kind of, it's just a fact of the world. And that's yeah, how I, we have to think about this polycentrism and then work from there. I, I think you're on the right track. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Great. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to go back to our, our question queue now. We have another question actually on polycentricity, um, and it asks if you're familiar with the writings of a legal philosopher named Lon L. Fuller um, uh, on polycentricity and institutional ordering, uh, and suggests there's a synthesis between Fuller and Ostrom uh, that could be explored uh, about uh, water management and, and free markets. Um, so yes, do you have any thoughts on, on uh, are you familiar with Fuller? Um, and if not, perhaps you could talk a little bit about Ostrom and water management. Um, I'm not familiar with that individual's work, but I'm looking forward to checking it out. So thank you very much for the recommendation. Right. Um, and then a uh, question, this is actually, I think, quite interesting. Um, so when I think of Ostrom, I certainly think of her thinking being applied to, um, you know, physical resource problems and, and the you know, commons problems and, and potential solutions. But someone asks, uh, you know, does her thinking apply at all to digital commons? Would, would Wikipedia be the kind of thing that perhaps Ostrom would have either thought about or you could apply some of her models to? Yeah, Eleanor Ostrom was really interested in knowledge commons, actually. And one of the original um, polycentric orders, if you read Vincent Ostrom's elaboration of this concept, was knowledge, academic knowledge, but what we understand in general. So if you, I'll point to a resource that will be valuable for I think many of these different areas, and that's the Digital Library of the Commons. 
it's still maintained at Indiana University Bloomington on, on their websites. And it, it's massive. So the number of studies that have been conducted by the Ostroms, by people connected to the Ostroms, by people at research centers around the world building off those ideas is incredible. And so the, there, she did do pretty intensive study of the knowledge commons and of a variety of different um, situations where there are emergent phenomena without intended design from the top down. Um, so systems like Wikipedia are certainly a part of that. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd point you towards the, the digital library of the commons and just towards the idea in general of spontaneous or emergent order, which all that she was critical of the phrasing spontaneous, but not of the idea that there are processes and you know, predictable patterns that emerge from individual behavior that were not the intent necessarily of those individuals. I know that some people use the term emergent order for the reason of you know, having some quibbles with, with spontaneous. Would she have fallen into that camp? Did she ever use that term in her writing? I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. That might be a haven't had my second cup of coffee issue. So it's quite possible. There. No, no problem. Quite a, quite a specific question. So <laughs> I, was just, I was just curious. We've got uh, we've got one more question from someone actually joining us from Cameroon, which is another nice of the uh, things about to being able to do these things online. So I'm going to invite Tegan to ask uh, his question. Actually, I'm not sure if it's he or her. I'll ask their question uh, uh, vocally. Then I've got one sort of wrap up question that, that we'll do following that. So please go ahead, Tegan. Tegan, can you hear us? Gonna give about 10 more seconds if you're able to speak up. I don't know what the internet connection is like there. Oh, I heard something. Oh my, this is bad. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Is it better now? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm Tegan Victor from Cameroon. Uh, um, Mail. Thank you very much, Jamie, for your talk. It's been I've been following so wonderfully, Thank you. and um, yeah, I am I'm, I'm quite. Um, I'll take some more background search on that. I, I'm I'm a little new to libertarian thinking and concepts, but I it's it's made a lot of sense to me, and especially from my background as an African as a Cameroonian, um, I can actually, you know, practically tell you how. Uh, um, um, centralization has destroyed or, you know, uh, hampered development for Africa. Now, the, the issue is this. I have, I have um, a, a huge debt to my nation, to my community in spreading libertarianism, liber uh, which I started already. I have this um, little school um, 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 group which we've set up. I've also come up with a little think tank here in, in Africa, teaching on leaders, training on leadership and other things. And um, liberty and freedom, uh, rights and peace building is one of the things we do. Now, my question is this. For me, as um, 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 someone new into the area of peace building and, 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 and liberty and freedoms, it's very risky for me back here in Africa, in Cameroon, to openly um, teach those concepts, especially when they are so true, so real, but very counter to what the government, you know, is, is coming up with. So uh, I would say, how do I cover my turf? How can you advise me in covering my turf as far as going ahead with the teaching of um, libertarianism, uh, peace building and freedoms and like recently you would know we just came we were in a four year long conflict a four year long war which would have been avoidable we've lost close to 2000 uh, lives and about 1 million have you know fled out of their homes with more than uh, almost 500,000 refugees just on something that could be handled just with 
you know, a little understanding, but just because of all the centralization, that's where we are. So bringing up ideas of liberty and freedoms and all of that could, it, it could, it could really, it could put me in some very bad places. So how would you advise me to, to how can I go about it? In an, in an environment where almost everybody, for the young people, they are kind of looking somewhere else. They're like, they're looking, they are facing, they're having a different vision. But for the people in power and their cronies, it's different. So how, how do you think I could go about it? Thank you. Well, well, first of all, thank you for sharing your experience and a little bit about your work. Um, it's very easy to forget um, for many of us that the struggle for freedom cannot be taken for granted. And there are many people who still are fighting for even the most basic liberties like freedom of expression. Um, so, you know, thank you for that reminder. And I know Eleanor Ostrom's work has resonated for people around the world um, because of, as you said, the practical implications that it does have for undertaking self-governance and for individuals taking control at the at the local level. Now, I would never hazard to offer you any specific advice because I just don't know enough about the the situation and the risks that you face. Um, so so I don't know if I can can offer you anything specific. I know in China there have been Ostrom studies and Ostrom institutes, but there they have faced situations of, I don't know, specifically at the, at the Ostrom Center, but there have been, you know, libertarian scholars have, um, and organizations have been shut down and not allowed to, to speak even today. And it sounds like maybe expression is relatively freer there than what you're facing. Um, so all I can do is wish you the best of luck and thank you for joining us you know, here today for this conversation. And, you know, I hope something that we share can be useful for you. But yeah, that, that's the great danger because when, when individuals become empowered, that does become a threat um, to a tyrant. And so that's, um, that's the, the reality of freedom. So I just, I applaud you and your efforts and I'm sorry, I cannot be more specifically helpful. Thanks, Jamie. I'm going to ask you uh, one last question, and then, and then we'll just uh, wrap up. But of course, if people were to read one thing about Eleanor Ostrom and her ideas, it should be your forthcoming book with uh, Vlad Charko. But if someone were to read another thing, is there a, a book or a paper by Ostrom you would recommend? Is there something uh, else about her work that you think is perhaps more accessible to, to a lay audience? Uh, uh, if you met someone who asked for one additional thing to read aside from your book, what would you suggest? Um. I'm going to, can I cheat and suggest three things? Sure. Why <laughs> um, not? So, so first, watch the PBS documentary, Actual World Possible Futures. You'll love it. Your mom will love it. Your kids will love it. Um, everybody will have, enjoy it. They talk about the, just the difficult background they came from and all the work they did and how this philosophy and this great understanding emerged from it. It's, it's wonderful. Um, then read... Uh, governing the Commons, if you want that overview of um, the, the magic of self-governance and what it can accomplish, and then finish up by reading Vlad Tarko's intellectual biography of Eleanor Ostrom, um, which is wonderful. So, so that trio, and you can start by watching the documentary today. It's so easy. You don't even have to wait for it to air. It's on their website. Wonderful. That, that's great. Thanks. And I'll, I'll say we can, uh, we send out a, a wrap up email following the talk, uh, announcing the book draw winner. I'm going to put links to those three things, uh, the, the documentary, the book, and then the, uh, the second book by Vlad Tarko into that email. So if anyone's scrambling to write those down, uh, you'll find that in your inbox soon. Um, we're going to wrap up now. I want to thank all of you guys for joining us. Uh, again, I know that many people have so many Zoom calls, so we're, we're really privileged and, and lucky that, uh, that 
that uh, you took the time to join us and, and we're thankful you did. Of course, a big thank you to Jamie Lemke for, uh, for joining us. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, to host you, Jamie. Uh, and in conclusion, I just want to mention that uh, we have now opened uh, applications or registration for our online Freedom Week. Uh, Freedom Week is normally a one week seminar for students that we do in person in Canada. Uh, it was online last year and, and we were hoping that perhaps it would be in person this year, but it looks like we're gonna have to wait till the fall for, uh, for events to really resume here in Canada. So you can find those uh, links to Freedom Week registration on our website. One nice thing about doing it online is that uh, people can join us who are not students and not even in Canada. Uh, with our in-person seminars every year, there are some students from Africa who tried to join us visa problems, travel problems, we're never able to make it. We did have people from Africa join us last year, and I hope some of those people, uh, maybe even including our friend Tegan, will be able to join us again this summer. So you can find registration links if you're a student in Canada. We have a special sort of incentive to thank you for your time. We'll give you a $100 Amazon uh, gift card. Um, but if you're not in Canada or not a student, you're still welcome to join us. So I want to thank again all of you for joining us. Big thanks to Jamie for joining us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to being able to get our hands on that book. You have a few minutes left to enter that draw. We will send a copy of that out. Uh, but if you don't win it, then I definitely encourage you to look at buying it when it is available and released. With that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, look forward to seeing uh, many of you hopefully next week. Uh, Malcolm Lavoie is going to be presenting on Canada's economic constitution. I think that's going to be a great talk. Malcolm's a good friend of the ILS, and we're always happy to have him. With that, I will sign off. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Stay safe. Hope to see many of you next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Jamie.